In, the, in our own language, we call it Kurima Kwechinyakari, meaning our traditional agriculture. That describes that we, what we inherited from our parents, which has sustained our parents, our environment for generations. So it's, some, it's not something very new to Zimbabwe, no, no. It's actually an old practice that has been continued to be practiced by farmers and which have become so strong in Zimbabwe, especially during the last decade of the economic crisis, where completely there was no any other food you could find in any shop. But because people had their own local resources, and because people had their own knowledge, and because people had their own seed on their hands, they were able to produce. When we talk about ecology, it's something that connects agriculture, paysan avec les connaissances des ancêtres, ensuite les recherches scientifiques. Donc on doit combiner ça. My name is Jyoti Fernandez. Um, I have a farm in the UK. It's a family farm. Um, I would consider it an ag agroecological farm. I never really thought of that, um, calling it an agroecological farm. It's just a farm that's based on a lot of different elements until you know, I met with the concept of agroecology and thought, you know, it really fits. This is based really, uh, you know, we did our farm um, based on what we thought was the traditional elements of agriculture in our area and started to incorporate those elements. And um, by the time you look at what's in your environment and you create a farm, um, based on that, um, and you look at the local markets and the diversity of products you can sell to a local market, um, it, it is an agroecological farm. Mas usando esse modelo da agricultura, o camponês tem menos custos, não usa muitos produtos que, que saem através do mercado externo e não usa muito o, o, as sementes que são preparadas que vêm de fora, mas sim as sementes são preparadas localmente. Os adubos, usamos os elementos que estão em volta da nossa machamba e preparamos o compostagem onde aplicamos sem, menos, sem muitos custos. Donc l'agroécologie, ben, c'est, on allait dire, ça fait partie des savoirs traditionnels de n'importe quel paysan ou paysanne du monde entier. N'importe, c'est grâce à cette agroécologie paysanne, parce que paysanne non pas parce que c'est que les agriculteurs ou les cultivateurs ou les agricultrices ou cultivatrices, paysanne parce que c'est on est d'un pays, d'un terroir, d'un territoire. Et cette agroécologie, c'est elle qui a nourri l'humanité jusqu'à maintenant. Si on n'y avait pas une agroécologie euh, on va dire à 80% qui respectent les territoires, les écosystèmes, les temps de pêche, les temps de chasse, les, les moments de semis, la sélection des semences pour qu'elles soient adaptées au fil des ans et au fil des terroirs, euh, peut-être qu'on ne serait même pas là en train de faire l'interview. I'm an organic farmer and uh, we built the organic uh, movement uh, 30 years ago. Agricology is what can help us to have always in mind that organic, for example, is not only techniques, but it's also a tool to change our society. And organic had this role in Europe, no? To relink a farmer to the society, because all our activity was to change the market, to reconnect the citizens to the farmer, the urban area to the rural area. That was our idea, no? And it's clear that we are losing that. A part of the organic sector, the so-called organic industry, is going another way, another direction. From my experience, um, indigenous people have a holistic, have a holistic way of uh, seeing 
um, agriculture or hunting and gathering. You know, it's it includes spirituality. It includes uh, growing the food. It includes knowing the seeds. So if you put agriculture in the middle, like uh, like the, in the nucleus then that involves all of those aspects of life. You know, community, family, friends, everything. Our mode of life and our, the way we live off the ocean and off the resource is very different. It's not commercial, it is it's livelihood, you know, it's a spiritual in, in, and, and social interaction. La agroecología es una forma de poder producir nuestros alimentos de manera armónica con la naturaleza. Me parece que la agroecología retoma todos los principios de nuestras cosmovisiones como pueblos eh, originarios, como pueblos indígenas. La agroecología es importante también porque puede garantizar la sostenibilidad de la biodiversidad, que para nosotros la biodiversidad es el principio y el fin de la vida y de las culturas, de los pueblos. Y creo que la agroecología es importante en este momento de, de crisis climática para dar respuestas desde los territorios, desde nuestros territorios poder trabajar. Es una práctica ancestral que en la actualidad pues está tomando una posición política ante el modelo de agricultura industrial, al monocultivo principalmente, a los efectos del cambio climático y entonces eh, la capacidad de resiliencia que las comunidades podemos tener a través de prácticas sostenibles como la agroecología. So I see agroecology as a vehicle through which um, truly sustainable um, food production and uh, ways for us to connect with the land in general and can happen in a way that's really owned by the populace in a way that doesn't just create a new market but that in a way that's um, allowing us to access uh, affordable food for each other, providing good uh, income for the producers um, and goes beyond hopefully goes the, beyond the idea of just singular farms, you know, and, and more collective action. C'est ce qui nous a forcé, le changement climatique nous a forcé à pratiquer l'agro-pastoralisme. Donc, les défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés, un, nous avons par exemple le manque, surtout la fluctuation des pluies, le manque d'eau, très souvent dans le Grand Sahel, ce qui explique le fait que tous les animaux redescendent et toutes les personnes redescendent en même temps que les animaux aussi vite que possible. On faisait huit mois et actuellement on fait deux mois ou trois mois. Donc ça c'est un défi, le manque d'eau et le manque d'herbe. C'est avec cette sécheresse que nous, nous avons commencé à manger le mille. Vous avez vu C'est là. Donc, et si nous cultivons, l'agro, les bénéfices de l'agriculture sont donnés aux animaux. Vous avez vu. Donc nous, nous sommes obligés de cultiver l'herbe pour donner aux animaux. Au lieu de cultiver l'herbe, maintenant on cultive et le riz et le mille. Le riz, nous prenons les graines, le mille, nous prenons les graines. Maintenant, les gerbes ou les tiges, nous donnons ça aux animaux. L'important est que l'agroécologie est un modèle qui nous fait nous peut être désigné de ici à la base. C'est un modèle qui doit être désigné à partir de la base que é o mais importante no terreno e a partir daí nós temos que promover mais o intercâmbio de troca de experiência entre as comunidades, entre as províncias e a nível é, nacional e internacional. É assim como nós temos conseguido a, a, a expansão do conhecimento sobre a agroecologia. L'agroécologie, si ça doit devenir un concept porté par des politiques publiques, je pense que la définition, le contenu et les options politiques doivent être, doivent 
la définition de ces options doit revenir aux communautés paysannes. En Europe, nous avons 40 millions de farmers, 12 hectares de l'average size of the farm. Nous sommes small et moyens farmers en Europe, nous ne sommes pas quelque chose d'autre. Et nous faisons le food pour les Européens. Je veux dire, nous produisons le food pour les Européens. Pour sûr, l'industrie agricole est là, elle est très forte. Very good lobby, very well organized. All the public policy is for that. Common agriculture policy is something like 55 billion euro per year, and all those 55 billion are going the wrong direction. So it's it's not an easy task to build an agricultural model in Europe. We've, we've got big obstacles. I mean, the first obstacle we have is, you know, we historically have had the right to go to the ocean, to go and harvest different species in small little boats, so we don't make an impact on big, uh, using lots of fuel and so on. Small little vessels, we go, we go to sea, and then we come back and we share and we sell. But what has recently happened is that our government in South Africa, about 10 years ago, introduced a new law that said all fishing is commercial fishing. So you could only get a right or a permit to go to sea if you're a commercial fisher. We are not commercial fisher. So therefore our right to go to sea have been taken away. We've been disenfranchised. And that has been the single biggest blow because the right to go to sea is not just the physical act of going to fish. It is go, it's preparing to go to fish, which involves a lot of women, a lot of young people. It is going to fish, it's coming back, and then processing and selling the fish and sharing it out, which is all the role that the women play. And a lot of our fishing activity is connected to the culture in the community. So effectively by saying you can't go to sea because you're not commercial, government takes our livelihoods, take our culture away. So that is the huge, the biggest impediment that we are currently experiencing in, in South Africa. And we have fought it. Right? We have not taken it down lightly. We have, we have said to government that you have not consulted us, or they claim that they have, but you know, when they say they consult, they, 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 by that they mean they've come to tell us this is what they're doing. We have not had an opportunity to decently engage. Later in, the, in 2014, uh, it came out uh, this proposal, uh, this initiative from France in FAO to have a symposium on agriculture that was quite uh, uh, something unexpected. Yo creo que hoy abrimos, como yo tengo dito, una ventana en esta ese edificio la sede de la FAO en Roma, que más de medio siglo es considerado la catedral de la Revolución Verde. Como vous savez, FAO es la institución de la ONU y responsable de la cuestión alimentaria en el mundo. Pero vous savez que FAO es generalmente dominé et par les entreprises multinationales, les pays industrialisés qui prônent l'agriculture la, industrielle. Donc euh, maintenant, c'est intéressant que le FAO aujourd'hui prend la responsabilité d'organiser un forum et, et sur l'agroécologie. Et nous pensons que ça est un pas et de la bonne direction. C'est le premier pas et là je pense que au niveau des organisations paysannes et comme et la Via Campesina et d'autres organisations de la société civile, nous devons continuer à, à faire pression sur FAO pour que FAO s'engage dans le vrai chemin parce que le seul chemin qui peut résoudre le problème de la faim vraiment dans le monde, c'est l'agroécologie. Et aujourd'hui, le monde industriel, le monde capitaliste est dans une impasse. Et... Mais c'est quand même un système qui a la force de toujours récupérer tout. 
Et donc, ils nous ont emmené l'agriculture conventionnelle, l'agriculture moderne, l'agriculture raisonnée. Et maintenant, on nous dit, ah, en bloc, qu'est-ce qu'on va inventer comme... Là, l'agroécologie, c'est à la mode. Donc, ce sont ceux même là qui parlent d'agroécologie. Donc, moi, pour moi, l'agroécologie, elle est paysanne ou l'agroécologie des peuples, des communautés. Then we decided to participate, to support, and somehow it was interesting because, as you was said, there are two clear ideas of agriculture. You know, somebody that wants to use agriculture as a tool to maintain the situation as it is, just a greening of the industrial agricultural model, a foul open a window in the institutions. I mean, it's important that we keep this window very open and keep this window full of our contents. Still, and this forum is so important because we are putting together all this different knowledge and we need to have a common definition, a common understanding, and then fight in all the different fora to defend our idea of agroecology, how we want to call it, people of agriculture, peasant agriculture, but we needed this time to do that. have this food movement and this debate around agriculture, but it's really centered from this very urban consumerist perspective that is driving a narrative that doesn't articulate, on one hand, the need for the fundamental class um, restructuring of society and the way agriculture is able to do that, or agroecology is able to do that, and on the other hand, articulates this notion that as long as we have good and f good, healthy food, things are okay, it'll be more accessible. And so in this regard, you know, the articulation is organic and food, so and food security are one model, and that's the predominant narrative that we're seeing in the U.S. And then you have agroecology and food sovereignty, which needs to be understood and taken by the young people re-entering into agriculture. And so this is where the political training um, and the, the radicalization of agroecology has to, has to take place. We were talking in our working group earlier about um, uh, agroecology as the tool with which we can reach food sovereignty. So agroecology not as being the destination, agroecology as being the, the articulation of, of how we're going to get to food sovereignty. And that's how we use it in, uh, in the organization. It's, we do food sovereignty, so food sovereignty zones, and it's usually with the with the concepts of agroecology it's just that the word i guess it's not really used because like i said in a lot of communities who are hunters and gatherers you wouldn't choose agri the word agroecology so we kind of want to keep keep it to food sovereignty because then each tribe each nation each indigenous peoples can choose what food sovereignty means to them and maybe some of them want to use agroecology, that's what it means to them. But maybe want to, some want to choose hunting and gathering. Once we engage in our political study of our own lives as actors in this process and how that intersects with society and within our own communities and hopefully within the organizations we're a part of, we can begin to understand, well, what are the collective dynamics of advancing a shared vision? But without this, this political understanding, um, and these, these debates and dialogues. The notion of collectivity um, is just an idea that exists when we're selling produce and people come in and it just supports that one mechanism. We only see it as that one mechanism without seeing there's all these other facets that we can re-engage in. So the political organization of us in this process um, and the types of trainings that are being offered throughout La Via Campesina, but also organizations in the U.S. Um, that are advancing in this regard is, is really fundamental as we engage with youth and I mean older people too but you know young people we uh, <clears throat> we have a, a knack at desiring to do things a different way for better or for worse you know we, we're really good at not listening to our parents and that can be a really strong strong attribute for us as we think about you know this moment in our relationship as young people que la agroecología es el gran paraguas político de todas las agro e hidroculturas que los productores de alimentos a pequeña escala hacemos en el mundo, en los distintos territorios. Tiene el desafío de que es una propuesta de modelo alternativo a este sistema, pero que no homogeneiza lo que hacemos en los territorios, sino que se rige bajo principios en común, principios productivos, biológicos, sociales, políticos. 
eh, y yo creo que las mujeres hemos contribuido mucho a ese desafío, a entender que un modelo puede ser diverso y que no genera etiquetas, no genera recetas, no genera un marco cuadrado y que si no pasas por eso no entras. Es que hace un rescate de todos los saberes y de todas las formas que tenemos los pequeños productores de alimentos en el mundo, ¿no? incluyendo pescadores, pastores, recolectores, campesinos, pueblos indígenas, trabajadores. Eh, y en el caso de las mujeres, este, creo que ha permitido mirar esa, esa diversidad, pero con un sentido político en común. Y también ha permitido ser creativo en los territorios, ¿no? sin recursos de apoyo de un Estado, de un gobierno, eh, poder ser creativos y generar aprendizajes y procesos y acumulación, y eso creo que las mujeres hemos sido muy claras en ese, en ese aporte. Y tenemos so many sugestiones, you know, we have these workshops with the Via Campesina and all of us get together and we talk about all the problems that we've got. If the policy makers can listen to us who are on the ground doing these things every day, we know exactly what's holding us back. We know exactly what we need to do to become the backbone of food security in Europe. It's entirely possible. All we need the policy makers to do is to listen to our problems that we're facing every day. You know, we're trying to do this like with straight jackets on. We're trying to feed Europe with straight jackets on. And if you listen to us and take our passion and run with it, you know, we will have a Europe that's fed in the best way possible. Thank you. <laughs> et la, et la, la souveraineté alimentaire aussi, c'est l'autonomie paysanne. C'est-à-dire, les paysans doivent pouvoir euh, utiliser leurs semences, doivent pouvoir utiliser des, leurs connaissances pour la fertilité, pour la gestion de, de l'humidité dans le sol, pour un certain nombre de fers, et même pour la gestion des marchés locaux. Tout cela, je pense que fait partie de la souveraineté et a un lien étroit avec l'agroécologie. Donc, je pense qu'il n'y euh, a pas de souveraineté alimentaire sans agroécologie. Et certainement, il n'y aura pas. Eh, disons, eh, d'agroécologie qui va durer sans une politique de souveraineté alimentaire qui la soutient.